So with anemia, you're literally not delivering enough blood to your target organs, right? Target tissues. Um, so you're going to get things like fatigue, exhaustion. Um, just looking at the person, they're going to have pallor, right? So they might, if, if you look at their mucosal membranes, like if you look at the inside of their mucosal membranes in their mouth, it might look a little bit more pale. Um, if you look at underneath their, if you look at their eyes, they might have a little bit of paleness uh, in their uh, conjunctiva. You might also see if it's serious enough, you might see like fainting, dizziness, uh, et cetera. If it's really bad and it starts actually having effect on the cardiovascular system as a whole, the, the heart is going to try to overcompensate for anemia. So in other words, your heart is going to start beating really rapidly and you can go into tachycardia because of that. So tachycardia just means accelerated heart rate. Um, if, it's pretty, if it's really severe and it's actually starting to affect the uh, cardiac myocytes, then you're going to actually get angina. So angina just means like chest pain. Um, angina, generally speaking, is going to be due to like vasospasms that can happen. Um, but you can also get angina if you're not delivering enough oxygenated blood to uh, your heart. Um, so I'm not going to go through all these on here, but these are some of the causes of anemia. You might have iron deficiency, right? You're not eating enough iron. Um, you might get that with, for instance, heavy menses. Uh, you can also uh, get anemia if you're not getting enough vitamin B12. Um, a lot of vegans uh, don't get enough vitamin B12. You get a lot of vitamin B12 either from leafy greens or you get it from red meat. Um, if you're not getting enough vitamin B12, then you can also get uh, 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 anemia. Um, intrinsic factor deficiency, that's called pernicious anemia. And intrinsic factor is going to be something that allows for the absor absorption of vitamin B12 in your GI tract. If you're not absorbing vitamin B12, then you get pernicious anemia, and that's due to basically vitamin B12 deficiency. You can also get anemia from lack of vitamin B, uh, uh, B9, so that's folic acid. And if you get renal failure, right, so if you have like end-stage renal disease, like stage four uh, renal failure, your kidneys are what help to produce erythropoietin. If your kidneys are not working properly, you're not producing enough erythropoietin, and now you're going to have uh, reduced production of your erythrocytes. These are all other causes, so sickle cell anemia, which we're going to talk about in a second here. Aplastic anemia, that means that your bone marrow is not producing red blood cells. Um, it's a very serious and thankfully rare condition. It's usually caused by cancer, tumors, um, and there are certain toxins that can also cause aplastic anemia. Those kinds of patients get necrosis of their tissues. Their tissues will literally start to die. So they can get that in any part of their body. Um, and so pretty serious condition. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about sickle cell anemia. So this is a healthy uh, uh, hemoglobin molecule, right? And that's going to be found in your red blood cells. With sickle cell anemia, it's a genetic disorder that causes uh, defective hemoglobin production. And if you get chains of hemoglobin, then that's going to uh, uh, predispose your red blood cells to undergo sickling. The cells are not always going to be sickled, right? If a patient has sickle cell disease, then uh, they usually get sickling through different like triggering factors. Um, dehydration is a common triggering factor for sickle, uh, sickle cell disease. There's a bunch of them. So a person, person that does have sickle cell disease, they're not always going to be undergoing a sickling crisis. But when they do get sickling crises, it can be extremely painful, right? Because you're getting these misformed red blood cells causing occlusions, getting trapped into capillary beds, not delivering oxygen to tissues. It's a very serious condition that can cause serious pain. Um, it's going to be found mostly in patients of African descent. And I'm going to show you a little uh, brief video about the specific regions in Africa that are uh, associated with sickle cell disease. Why? Do you, th oh well, <laughs> I already put it on there. So if you have the sickle cell trait, it's going to help protect you from malaria. Okay, so that's the reason why a lot of patients that are of African descent are going to have sickle cell trait. A lot of them are also going to have sickle cell disease. So where I went to med school in Dominica, it's a little island out in the West Indies, it's like 98% African um, or African descent. And we had a lot of sickle cell patients. Um, I used to see patients all the time getting treated when they were going through sickling crises, and it's very, very painful. 
Um, the only way that you can, well, you can treat it therapeutically with like pain management. You can also treat it with blood transfusions. But the only way that you can actually cure sickle cell disease is if you actually uh, have a uh, bone marrow transplant. That's the only way to really actually cure it. Now, <clears throat> in terms of other symptoms, it can affect kidneys, it can affect the heart, it can result in stroke. So not, it's no joke, it's a very severe uh, disease and illness. But evolutionarily speaking, it's very uh, beneficial for an individual in a malaria endemic region to have the sickle cell trait. So I'm going to show you a video of what that looks like in a little bit here. Actually, right now, let's go ahead and watch it. So you can see the full video here, but let's just show, watch a, a, a very short clip about this. Just take a little finger prick or a little heel prick, get a little sample of blood. First thing you did is look at the malaria parasite. Then you tested for the sickle cell character. You found that children carrying the character had a lower parasite count. If they were partially protected. And when he examined the blood of about 5,000 individuals, he done a massive study. The correlation was really clear. So clear, in fact, that he could really draw a map of East Africa and shade in the areas of high incidence of sickle cell, and they were superimposed right on top of the areas of high incidence of sickle cell. Many samples and detailed maps made it clear there was a connection between sickle cell and malaria. To understand how sickle cell might protect people from malaria, it required thinking about the genetics of sickle cell. Just take a little finger prick or a little heel prick, a little sample of blood. The first thing you did was look at the malaria parasite load. Okay, I just literally repeated on itself. Um, so, pretty cool. Um, so, if you are a carrier of the trait, then you can protect yourself from malaria. But if you're uh, full sickle cell uh, homozygous, then you're going to actually have sickle cell disease. So the way that uh, sickle cell anemia is transmitted genetically, um, it's going to be just basic uh, genetics. It's going to be autosomal dominant. Or sorry, it's autosomal recessive. So if uh, mom and dad are both heterozygous, that means only one out of four of those kids are actually going to be full-blown sickle cell disease. Um, one half, 50% of those kids, are going to be sickle cell carriers because they're heterozygote. And then um, one-fourth are going to be homozygous, unaffected. They're not going to actually have the sickle cell trait. So pretty straightforward genetics. Um, let's get into blood typing. Now, blood typing um, can be a little confusing a little bit but we're going to go through it in detail. I'm definitely going to have a few questions on the exam about blood typing as well as transfusion reactions. So let's get into a little bit of history. Um, this guy, Dr. Uh, Landsteiner, was the first one to actually do the blood typing, to identify A versus B versus AB versus O blood types. This was done back in the 1930s. And because of the ability for us to actually type blood, that's why we can actually do safe transfusions nowadays. So you can actually do the blood typing, give a person a blood transfusion, and by and large, you're not going to see any transfusion reactions unless there was, for whatever reason, an error in the actual typing to begin with. Um, so the way that blood typing works is that you have these surface antigens on uh, the surface of your red blood cells. You have uh, both A, B, type surface antigens, as well as rhesus surface antigens, too. So we'll talk about rhesus in a second. Um, when you hear the term antigen, think about something that provokes an immune response, right? An antigen can be literally anything. It could be pollen can be antigens. Uh, if you have a nickel allergy, those can also be antigens, those little like nickel metal uh, uh, particles. Those are called haptins, by, by the way. Um, sometimes uh, certain types of bacteria can have antigens. Usually on a bacteria, we call those epitopes. They're on the surface of the bacteria. But by and large, those are effectively antigens. Once an antigen gets recognized by an immunoglobulin, that's when you get the actual immunological reaction, right? A lot of different things can happen. Usually it's uh, agglutination for red blood cells. But you can get like cell-mediated immunity being affected. You can get complement system getting affected by antigens. You basically just have an immune reaction as a, as a, uh, in consequence of one of these antibodies uh, binding and attaching to an actual antigen. 
<clears throat> so let's get into it. So agglutination, this is a side note too, agglutination, that just means that all the red blood cells get clumped up, and once that happens, those blood cells are going to undergo lysis. So you get hemolysis as a consequence. So let's talk about how this happens here. So you have a couple different types of surface antigens. You have A, B, and RH, which is rhesus, uh, and some people refer to it as, as D antigen as well. So, but for the purpose of this class, we're going to refer to it as rhesus or RH. Now, if you're type A, you're going to have the A antigen, okay? And if you're type B, you're going to have the B antigen. And if you're type AB, you have both of those antigens, A and B. If you're type O, you have no antigens whatsoever. Now, um, some of the more common are going to be type A as well as type O. Now, let's talk about what this means. Now, if you have type A, that means you have those A surface antigens. That means you're gonna, your body is going to form antibodies against the other types. So you're going to form antibodies against type B antigens. Okay? So you're not going to form antibodies against yourself unless you have an autoimmune disorder. But generally speaking, you're not going to form antibodies against yourself, so you're not going to have uh, type A antibodies if you're a type A uh, blood type, okay? So in other words, type A, you're going to have anti-B antibodies. If you're type B, you have anti-A antibodies. Now if you're type AB, you're not going to have um, antibodies against either. So you're not going to have antibodies against type A or type B. Now, if you're type O, you have absolutely no antigens on your cell, on the blood cell, but you're going to have antibodies against all the above. Okay? So let's talk about what this means in, uh, well, we'll go into that in a second here. So here's just another summary of what that looks like. So if you're type A, you're going to have anti-B um, antibodies. If you're type B, you're going to have anti-A antibodies. If you're AB, you're not going to have any antibodies. Otherwise, you would destroy your own red blood cells. If you're type O, you have no antigens, so your body creates antibodies against all the other blood types. Okay? Um, and then, I know we finished off with a few of these questions. Let's go ahead and complete those quizzes questions for chapter 18, just to summarize everything that we just went over. Well, I'll fast forward to the exact spot that we ended last time. So let's go ahead and log in, and I'll fast forward to that question. And then we'll do this again at the end because I have uh, about eight questions at the end of this chapter. One, two, three, four, five, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. It has no antigens, but it has the antibodies against everything else. Cool. Two more, 53. Who's having trouble logging in? Yeah? It's still loading? Okay, I'll give you a second. I'll, uh, I'll take attendance based on this one, okay? So I'll, I'll have all of you guys log, log in for this one. Is it still loading? All right, one more. If you didn't log, if you weren't able to log in, go ahead and just write your name down on a piece of paper and give it to Suudia at the end of class, just so we can track your attendance. So I'm going to go ahead and start. And sorry, let me fast forward. Is this where we ended last time? I don't know. Oh, 
but we did get through all those. You know, I just realized something. I think we finished all the quizzes questions on Tuesday, didn't we? We didn't? You had, you had three more? Okay. So, good enough. All right, well, all right, next one is the last one. Like I said, I'll take attendance off of this one. So. All right, cool. So we're going to talk about our leukocytes in a little bit. Lymphocytes, good job on that, sort of. Lymphocytes is the second most common uh, leukocyte. Neutrophils is the most common. It's like 50 to 70% of all your white blood cells are going to be neutrophils. Roughly 20 to 30% of all of your white blood cells are going to be lymphocytes. And all the other ones are going to be less abundant, like way less abundant. So, yeah. <laughs> Let's continue on. We'll have more questions at the very end. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about blood typing, but now let's get into rhesus uh, typing. So rhesus, or RH, uh, also known as the D antigen. This was discovered back in the 1940s. It was discovered from rhesus monkeys. So that's where you get the name. Um, it is referred to as D antigen, but in this class, we're only going to refer to them as RH. Um, so this is usually uh, formed when, during pregnancy. So for instance, if a uh, child, if the developing child is RH positive, um, but the mom is RH negative, then the mom is going to develop antibodies against RH, against rhesus. So it's, they're going to develop antibodies against those D antigens. Um, you can also get this through transfusion as well. So if you get transfused from a person that was RH positive, now you're going to uh, develop, um, you're going to be exposed to RH, and now you're going to develop antibodies. Um, so let's see what that looks like over here. So one key thing to keep in mind about the antigens. Antigens are specifically on the red blood cell. It's not going to be in the plasma. The antibodies, on the other hand, that is within the plasma. So those are free-floating in the plasma. So here's a list of all the different blood types. So if you see positive, that positive means rhesus. That's the D antigen, okay? So if it's A positive, that means they're going to have not only A, but they're also going to have the RH on the red blood cell as well. In the blood, they're going to have the anti-B antibodies. Sorry, in the, in the plasma, okay? Anti-B antibodies in the plasma because they're always going to have the opposite of what their letter is. If it's A, they're going to have anti-B antibodies. Um, a negative, that means they do not have rhesus. If they're A negative and they don't have rhesus, now they're going to actually have anti-RH antibodies, right? If they were um, A positive, they would, you're, if you did have RH, uh, anti-RH antibodies while being A positive, that means your antibodies would attack itself. So that's why you don't want to attack yourself. You're going to have uh, anti-RH antibodies only if you're A negative. So the same things apply to B uh, positive as well as B negative. Now let's talk about AB and AB negative. So AB positive, you're going to have all the antigens. You're going to have A, a B, and uh, rhesus antigen on the red blood cell. Now because you have all of those, your plasma is not, you're not going to find any of those antibodies in your plasma. Otherwise, your plasma cells, or sorry, the immunoglobulins in your plasma would attack itself. Okay? Um, <clears throat> AB negative, you do not have rhesus, so you're going to have the anti-rhesus antibody. And then O plus and O negative. For O plus, you have rhesus. That's the only thing that's going to be on the red blood cell. Um, and because it's O and you don't have the A or B antibody or antigens, then you're going to have the A and B anti uh, antibodies as well in your plasma. And then for O negative, you have no uh, antigens whatsoever, no A, no B, and no rhesus, 
And so you're going to have the antibodies against all the above. All right? So let's talk about why that matters in a clinical setting in terms of receiving and donating blood. So if you're AB positive, you're going to be able to receive uh, blood basically from any blood category. Okay? So if you're AB positive, you do not have any of the antibodies in your plasma. Okay? So that means you're going to be taking the blood from a, 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 a donor, and you're going to be able to receive that blood regardless of what their blood type is. Because you do not have any antibodies whatsoever against any of the blood types. Versus O negative, that's going to be the universal donor. So an, a person with type O negative can donate to anybody. So, you know, donor, O, they kind of sound, you know, there's O's and donor. Maybe just a way for you to remember that. Type O negative is going to be donor. So just remember, AB positive, receiver, uh, O negative, donor. Okay, O, don. All right? I don't know if that helps, but hope it does. Yeah, so if you're a universal donor, you're going to have antibodies against everything. Yeah, so that's a great question. So, yeah, you're kind of screwed. You can, you can receive from other people who have type O negative. So type O negative goes to type O negative. So that's a great question. So that's the opposite, right? So if you're a universal donor, you're not going to be able to accept blood types from any of these categories at all because you have the antibodies against all of them. Only type O negative, okay? Cool. So I'm not going to play this uh, video on transfusion reactions. You guys can watch it on your own time. But these are the different types of transfusion reactions. You do not need to uh, commit these to memory. There's just four different types, but just know that they exist. And they exist, uh, there, there's some that are more acute than others. So for instance, febrile, uh, sorry, hemolytic, which is one of the most severe types, is going to happen basically within an hour. It's like a hypersensitivity type of uh, reaction. But there's other ones too. You can have allergic, anaphylactic type reactions. It happens a little bit long. It can be pretty serious. You can get septic shock, which can actually kill you as well. Um, so these are just different types of uh, transfusion reactions. And that's going to be generally due to some type of like mis misidentification of the blood. <clears throat> and in terms of rhesus, okay, so rhesus, that's going to be denoted by that positive or negative, right? So if they're type, if they're rhesus positive, that means they're going to have those um, Rh antigens on the surface of the red blood cell. If it's rhesus negative, you do not have those antigens. So that's why if you're type A negative, you're going to have the A antigens around the red blood cell, but you're going to have zero of those rhesus antigens. And it's going to happen either from mom being pregnant, if mom was type uh, it was like negative for rhesus, but then the baby, for whatever reason, became rhesus positive. Then the mom is going to develop antibodies against uh, rhesus positive. Okay? Um, <clears throat> this can also happen with those transfusion, uh, if you get transfused from a person that had rhesus positive. Now, the big concern about this is that you can develop a hemolytic disease of the newborn. So if mom gets pregnant, child is rhesus positive for the first pregnancy, but mom is rhesus negative, now mom is going to develop those anti-D antibodies, or anti-RH antibodies. Um, if mom gets pregnant again, and then the child once again is rhesus positive, then mom's antibodies are going to start attacking the baby. And when that happens, that can basically kill the child, and that can result in hemolytic disease of newborn. So very, very serious condition, right? Um, so the way we avoid ha uh, this happening is if your mom does have those uh, anti-rhesus antibodies because her first kid was Rh positive, but she was Rh negative, you can give her Rogam. And Rogam is going to be something that helps to basically contain those Rh antigens. It basically prevents those Rh uh, antigens from being recognized. And effectively what happens is that it's going to be suppressing the mom's immune system. So mom's immunoglobulins are not going to be able to actually cause any damage to the developing fetus, the second pregnancy, right? Does that make sense? Cool. So here's another summary of universal receiver versus universal donor. Um, so these would be like examples of like sample questions that you would see on your test. So 
let's see, transfusion reaction. If a type A positive patient received type O negative, does type O negative um, have any antigens on the actual red blood cell itself? It does not, right? So if it doesn't have those antigens, then it's not going to result in any sort of like hemolytic reaction in the patient, so you're not going to see any sort of transfusion reaction. Now, if a type O negative patient were to receive uh, A positive uh, blood, what would happen? The type O negative patient, what do you find in their plasma? Do you find antibodies in their plasma? You find antibodies against every single one of them, right? A, B, and the D antigen, aka rhesus antigen. So if a type O negative person does receive blood from any other blood type, except for type O negative, that will result in a transfusion reaction. So these are some examples of questions that you're going to see in your test. Okay? Hmm. And then this is just genetics of how blood types are actually um, carried on from parent to child. So think of O as being like not really anything. So think about alleles. You guys familiar with like what alleles are? So, for instance, you can have allele for blue eyes, you can have allele for like, you know, green eyes, allele for brown. Some alleles are going to be more dominant than others. Um, if you have two parents that have A and A, just one letter, that means, think of it as being like A0, right, or AO, right? They have like, the O would supplant the other allele. So, in other words, if you did like a Punnett square of a parent that had A, like dad had A, mom had A, Think of both of them as, a, as having A and O, mom as A and O. So that means one-fourth of the children are going to actually be born as type O, right? All the rest of the kids are going to be type A. So three-fourths are going to be type A, only one-fourth is going to be type O. So in other words, you can have a child, if both parents have type A, you can have a child uh, with type O blood from those parents. Does that make sense? It's pretty simple, like uh, Punnett square uh, type uh, genetics. Same thing with rhesus. Very similar thing. So uh, rhesus, if uh, dad has a rhesus, you have positive and negative. If you're heterozygote, you're still rhesus positive. Right? Only the homozygous uh, rhesus negative is going to be negative at the end. So in other words, one-fourth of the kids are going to be rhesus negative. The rest are all going to be rhesus positive. And then if you're type O, if mom has type O, dad has type O, all the kids are going to have type O. Okay? They're not going to all of a sudden have type A, type B. It's not going to happen. Cool. Let's talk about leukocytes. So this is uh, bacteria. That is a gram-positive uh, staphylococcus bacteria. That's staphylococcus aureus, and it's getting engulfed by a phagocytosis by a leukocyte. I don't know if that's a neutrophil or a macrophage. I'm going to assume it's a neutrophil, just because that's usually what neutrophils do. They, they're going to be the first ones during a bacterial infection to come in and gobble up bacteria. So let's talk about the different leukocytes. So you have uh, granulocytes and you have agranulocytes. And by the way, I do want to issue a correction about something I said last uh, Tuesday. Let's, go, let's just straight, get straight to it. I talked about neutrophils and how they had granules. <laughs> I said something stupid. I said they had superoxide dismutase. Superoxide dismutase is mostly found in uh, aerobic bacteria. Superoxide dismutase transforms uh, reactive oxygen species, like uh, oxygen that can cause damage to the cells. It transforms those into hydrogen peroxide. Uh, so that's superoxide dismutase. It's a totally different enzyme. Neutrophils, on the other hand, have all these different enzymes as part of the way that they can combat bacteria. So they have things like myeloperoxidase, elastase, lactoferrin. So we'll talk about those in a second. I just wanted to put that correction out there because superoxide dismutase, you usually find it in like bacteria. You can find other cells too. But Anyways, um, let's get into those leukocytes. So uh, leukocytes are mostly going to be found uh, in like places like lymphatic organs. You can find them in connective tissues. Um, you do see them circulating within uh, the circulatory system. Um, but for the most part, you're going to see uh, two major categories, right? So you have those granulocytes and agranulocytes. You guys, in that last question that I asked on quizzes, um, some of you guys were kind of like leaning towards the right direction in terms of like numbers. The most numerous of all those leukocytes are going to be neutrophils, all right? 
uh, anywhere between 50 to 70 percent, depending on what textbook. This from this uh, reference, it says 60 to 70. If you if you think like 50 to 70, that's a pretty uh, accurate range. Um, lymphocytes, depending on the textbook, 20 to 30 percent. 25 percent, that's fine. Those are going to be your A granulocytes. All the rest are going to be much less numerous, especially basophils. You're not really going to see too many basophils in circulation. Thank God, because basophils are going to be associated with allergic reactions. So if you have basophils all of a sudden releasing histamine, that's going to cause increased vascular permeability. It's going to cause swelling. It's basically allowing for like a greater amount of inflammation. That's what uh, basophils do. Eosinophils, we're thinking more like parasitic infections, so we'll get into that in a second here. So let's talk about what these do. Neutrophils, think bacteria, okay? And they're going to be first at the site of infection. They do all sorts of crazy things. They can explode. That's called oxidative burst. They can release these nets, which are all made up of, like, DNA that help to trap bacteria. So those bacteria can get gobbled up through, like, macrophages, for instance. I'll show you a video of what neutrophils do in a second. Eosinophils. Think parasites, a helminths, like for instance, pinworms, tapeworms, liver flukes. Those are all going to be helminths, basically worms. So those are going to be greatly implicated uh, in parasitic infections. And then basophils, think like histamine, right? So allergic reactions. So if you had a spike in neutrophils, you'd be thinking, oh, a patient probably has a bacterial infection. A spike in eosinophils, you're thinking, oh, a patient might have like a helminth type of parasitic infection. So, let's watch a little tiny video on neutrophils, because neutrophils are actually pretty cool. The neutrophil is a powerful and vigilant defender, constantly prowling the in search of pathogenic invaders. When a target is encountered, it is swiftly engulfed and digested by the Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, let me close out of everything. <laughs> Like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> oh, red blood cells. Oh, okay, let's try that again. Here we go. <laughs> the neutrophil is a powerful and vigilant defender, constantly prowling the bloodstream in search of pathogenic invaders. When the target is encountered, it is quickly engulfed and digested by the voracious scavenger. After a kill, the hunter does something unexpected. It casts a net to capture additional prey. Neutrophils are efficient assassins who expect to die, not reproduce. The DNA is utilized as yet another weapon in their arsenal. When a pathogen is encountered, the neutrophil activates an enzyme, TAB4, to unpackage and tightly coil the chromosomal DNA to produce strands of sticky, blood like material. The nuclear contents are ejected from the neutrophil, along a deadly net composed of DNA strands interconnected by histones and impregnated with lethal. All right, so kind of cool. They do all sorts of cool stuff. They're like kamikaze soldiers. They go in there and just blow things up. So pretty wild. Uh, neutrophils are also going to be uh, when you have like pus formation, right? You get a lot of purulence. Uh, that's a lot of dead bacteria, and it's a lot of dead neutrophils. Um, and just as the video said, whenever those uh, neutrophils explode and do their dirty work, macrophages have to come in and basically clean up after them. So they, they release all these different things, uh, myeloperoxidase, elastase, which helps to destroy the bacteria, lactoferrin, iron-binding protein. A lot of bacteria love iron. It's like a really good source of nutrients for them. 
Um, when you guys do microbiology later on, you're going to eventually, uh, hopefully, grow uh, throat, throat cultures of streptococcus organisms on a blood auger. Blood augers have sheep blood on there, and organisms that really like blood will grow on those augers like crazy. So, and there's other types of uh, bacteria that love like hemolyzed blood. They call those chocolate augers because they look like chocolate. They're kind of brown. I wouldn't eat it if I was you. But you can also grow certain types of bacteria on there too. Um, but that's, uh, that's a side note. Um, so moving on. <clears throat> Here's a little fun video too. Ah, it's not going to play. That's okay. I got the link here. So this is like a neutrophil actually chasing down a bacteria. It's kind of fun. So that little bacteria right there, it's a little diplococcus. That's like two little balls, the diplococci. And it could be maybe like Neisseria mangitides, it could be Neisseria gonorrhea, or it could be even like Streptococcus pneumoniae. Those are sometimes diplococcus. But you can see that the neutrophil literally just chases down the bacteria and then just gobbles it up. So, good boy. <laughs> cells are kind of cute. Anyways, um, let's talk about agranulocytes, the ones that do not have granules. Um, those are going to be smooth, right? Uh, the two types are going to be lymphocytes. So that's this guy over here. It's just basically a big blob, giant nucleus. And it's got a little bit of tiny cytoplasm around the cell. Those are going to be heavily implicated in viral infections, but they're also going to be implicated in cancer as well. So for instance, like cytotoxic T cells, they'll actually induce apoptosis in cells that are affected by cancer, right? So if it's a cancer cell, T cells are what go in there and actually kill those cancerous cells. Um, <clears throat> they do require antigens to present it to them, but we are going to talk a lot about that when we get into lymphatics later on. And then monocytes, that's going to be this big uh, cell over here. The monocytes are going to be the biggest of all those leukocytes, really huge. Um, and they're going to have this kind of like horseshoe-shaped like kidney bean nucleus. That's kind of the way that you can differentiate between monocytes and other, other granulocytes, or other uh, leukocytes. Um, monocytes basically just go in there and like gobble up debris. They phagocytose. Monocytes can also like turn into uh, either macrophages or they can turn into dendritic cells. So right down over here, there's a monocyte that turns into a macrophage or a dendritic cell. Um, leukopoiesis. So that's going to be the production of your leukocytes. It's going to be happening in the uh, bone marrow. So red bone marrow is going to be one of the major places where you get granulocyte and uh, leukocyte production. Um, the thymus gland. The thymus is where T cells go to mature. That's where they go to further develop. And then um, in terms of circulation, you're not really going to see what white blood cells so much in the circulatory system. right? They're not going to be super abundant. Um, you do see a greater amount of leukocytes in leukocytosis which is generally going to be associated with either A, infection, or B, certain types of cancers, like leukemia. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but they can live for a long time. They do provide long-term immunity. So um, that's part of your like, memory cell. Your adaptive immune system can do that. Um, also, a lot of these cells are going to be involved in your innate immune system as well. You'll learn about all that later on. So let's talk about uh, clinical uh, uh, conditions. So if you have leukopenia, that means you have low uh, white blood cell count. If you have uh, leukocytosis, that means high blood cell count, white blood cell count. Cause of leukopenia, you can have like radiation, right? So if you were near like Chernobyl back in the 1980s, um, you might have your bone marrow getting wiped out. And then you might have the inability to develop leukocytes for the rest of your life. So if you have leukopenia, then you're going to be predisposed to getting infections, right? Because your leukocytes fight off infections. So it's pretty, pretty nasty. Leukocytosis, if you have way too many leukocytes, it can be normal. It can mean that you have an infection. It might be because you have an allergic reaction. You might see that rise in basophils, for instance. But if it's extremely high, like you see down here in this image on the bottom right that I put in there, that is going to be leukemia. Right? So that's cancer. And there's several different types of leukemia. Um, by the way, this is what a normal peripheral blood smear looks like. What is this cell right here? What do you guys think it is? This dude right here. Basophil? Eh. Basophils are going to be blue. Eosinophils are going to be kind of pinkish, reddish. 
Neutrophils are going to have this multi-lobular nucleus. So they have like, it's usually like three separate lobes. They can, differ, they can be different depending on the, the neutrophil. But generally speaking, it's going to be three different lo lobes, and it's going to be a multi-lobular nucleus. Um, and it's about like two to three times the size of a red blood cell. Uh, what do you guys think this one over here is? You have two choices. It's either a macrophage or it's a lymphocyte. Macrophage, lymphocyte, lymphocyte. So a macrophage would be much bigger than that. Lymphocytes are usually about as big as a red blood cell or just bigger than a red blood cell. Macrophages are way larger. Um, and then they have this big, big nucleus and a little bit of cytoplasm surrounding. Now this blood smear over here, that's going to be leukemia. So you see lots of crazy looking leukocytes that are not supposed to be there. Oftentimes they're going to be deformed depending on the type of leukemia. You have a couple different types. You have acute and you have chronic leukemia. Acute means that it's like pretty rapidly progressing um, versus chronic, kind of like longer term. And there's two different types of each. There's acute myeloblastic leukemia, acute lymphocytic leukemia, and there's chronic myeloblastic leukemia and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. We're not going to go into the detail of those. Those are for pathology. That's when you guys uh, get to that uh, 322 later on. So let's talk about blood clotting, hemostasis. Any questions so far? All right, the blood clotting cascade is like a nightmare, so bear with me. Um, it's the bane of basically everyone's existence in the, in the medical field because there's lots of different clotting factors. There's lots of different drugs that are involved in uh, blood clotting, like for instance, like clot, blood, blood, uh, clot busters, drugs like even warfarin, coumadin, um, heparin, so like anticoagulants. Uh, I'm even going to show an image of some like NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, like ibuprofen, aspirin. Those are all going to affect the clotting cascade in different ways. Um, I'm going to show you kind of what to focus on, so don't get too concerned, but it's quite a bit. So let's get into it. Let's first talk about platelets. Those are going to be one of the major components of the clotting cascade. Now, if you remember from that peripheral blood smear I showed you on Tuesday, you had those big fat leukocytes, right, those white blood cells. You see all the red blood cells, and then every once in a while, you see a tiny little blip. And those tiny little blips, those are going to be like little tiny platelets hanging out. Those platelets are going to be derived from megakaryocytes. Megakaryocyte is this giant cell that sloughs off little tiny platelets. They're mostly going to hang out in your bone. Okay? Um, so it's going to be fragments that come off from those megakaryocytes. Um, <clears throat> and they're going to be constantly being produced. They're going to be constantly being like, uh, 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 removed and replaced. So it's going to be about a period of like 9 to 12 days. It's kind of like the life cycle. Um, thrombocytopoiesis is going to be the actual production of thrombocytes. And then here are conditions that you can see. You can see sometimes patients will get thrombocytopenia. That means they're not producing enough uh, uh, platelets. That's usually going to be associated with you know, uh, a bone marrow disorder. D slash O, that means disorder. Thrombocytosis, where you have way too much uh, thrombocytes, that's usually going to be associated with a couple things, but infection is going to be amongst the underlying causes of thrombocytosis. You can also get CA. What does CA stand for? California. <laughs> it's, CA is cancer. So certain types of cancer can result in thrombocytosis. Um, so here's your megakaryocyte, just massive. Look, these are red blood cells. It's way larger. And these little fellows right here that are coming off, those are going to be your little platelets that just get like sloughed off from the megakaryocyte. <clears throat> so moving on. So let's talk about hemostasis, right? Stasis means stopping, right? So in other words, stopping the bleeding. So hemostasis is going to allow for the clotting cascade and stopping the bleeding. So you have a couple different phases of hemostasis. You're going to have the vascular phase where you're going to have vasoconstriction. Your blood vessels, if they get like severed or if they get injured for whatever reason, they're going to start vasoconstricting so they can help prevent blood loss. Right? That's going to be the very first uh, step, it's vasospasms. You're also going to see the platelet phase. And the, what the goal of the platelet phase is, is to create what we call a platelet plug. It's like a bunch of platelets that gather up, they basically cause a plug. 
right? So that's going to be a bunch of aggregation. Uh, and it's going to be associated with the release of a couple of different things. Um, ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, derivative from ATP, right? Adenosine triphosphate, it's just one, one phosphate group is gone. So ADP. Uh, thromboxane is going to be one of the things, too, that allows for uh, platelet activation. Also serotonin, there's going to be clotting factors. Calcium is going to be really important in the clotting cascade, not only for platelet aggregation, but also in both extrinsic and intrinsic pathways in the clotting cascade. And then you also have the coagulation phase, and that's going to be the overall clotting cascade, which we're going to talk about. The major goal of the clotting cascade is going to be this right over here, fibrin. Fibrin is going to be the major goal of the clotting cascade. Fibrin uh, does not dissolve, so it's going to form a fibrin mesh. It's insoluble, and that fibrin mesh is what allows for the uh, solidification of the blood clot. And then if you have fibrinolysis, that's basically going to be the destruction of that fibrin. That's what fibrinolysis means. Lysis just means destruction of, okay? Like hemolysis, hemolysis, right? It's the destruction of red blood cells. Fibrinolysis is going to be the destruction of that fibrin. So that's going to be all part of the clotting cascade. Now, let's talk about the vascular phase really briefly because it's very short, nothing really too crazy going on. If you have a knife blade or whatever, something damaging that uh, vessel for whatever reason, that's going to result in vasoconstriction of that vessel. The vessel is going to tighten up so that it prevents any blood from leaking out. Right? So you prevent further blood loss. Then you get platelet aggregation. And platelet aggregation is going to be associated with all these different compounds, right? Adenosine diphosphate, calcium, um, aggregate, uh, sorry, uh, clotting factors, all those things are going to be involved. And what happens is that you get this positive feedback loop. Because as more platelets start to aggregate, you get further release of all these different compounds, and it's going to like basically create more and more platelets to go to that site and try to create a nice little platelet plug so you can block the bleed. So maybe let's watch a little tiny video here about that. In the first step towards clot formation, platelets are recruited to the site of vessel injury by now exposed molecules of the vessel wall, such as collagen and von Willebrand factor. This factor mediates the linking of platelets to collagen via a specific receptor in the platelet membrane. The resulting change of shape of the platelet from its resting state into the dendritic form indicates activation. The activated platelet in turn releases prothrombotic molecules such as adenosine diphosphate, ADP. By binding to its receptors, ADP induces aggregation. And recruits further platelets to the site. Thromboxin is another important mediator of platelet activation and aggregation. Under its influence, the platelets crosslink with each other. These interlocking mechanisms cause platelet activation to snowball. The clot grows rapidly. Activated platelets also trigger the coagulation cascade and thus the formation of thrombin. Thrombin, in turn, stimulates platelet activation even further continuous feedback loop. Additionally, thrombin induces the formation of fibrin for the mesh stabilizing the clot. The self-reinforcing process of platelet activation, crucial in the formation of blood clots, is an obvious therapeutic target in conditions caused by inappropriately triggered blood coagulation. All right. Cool stuff. Let's move forward here. All right. So... This is, uh, these are some of the uh, chemical signals that are involved in the clotting cascade. So COX, which is cyclooxygenase, it's an enzyme that helps to uh, transform uh, arachidonic acid into these various compounds. So we just kind of focus on thromboxane, which is going to allow for platelet aggregation, right? It allows them to kind of like clump up and create that platelet plug. But you also have things like prostaglandins. 
And prostaglandins are going to be like inflammatory mediators. So prostaglandins can uh, do all sorts of things, some of which involve like pain, like actually like developing pain sensation. So I included these different types of drugs over here because a lot of these drugs are going to be anti-inflammatory drugs, right? They're going to be drugs that you can take if you're hungover in the morning. <laughs> you take some ibuprofen, that really helps you out. But it can also help you with like musculoskeletal pain. It can help you with all sorts of things. Um, so they block COX, which is cyclooxygenase. They're cyclooxygenase inhibitors, okay? And there's different ones that are selective for certain COX types. There's COX-1, COX-2, there's even COX-3. But um, cyclooxygenase is going to be the major target for a lot of these drugs. Um, and then in terms of aspirin, let's talk about aspirin. Why do some people take baby aspirin, aspirin 81 milligrams? Do you know anybody that takes baby aspirin? Older patients usually take baby aspirin, lots of older people. So let's think about this real quick. This is, we're talking pain here, but let's also talk about blood, because think about thromboxane. Right? If you're blocking COX-1 and you're blocking the production of thromboxane, then you're also going to prevent this from happening. You're going to prevent platelets from aggregating and sticking. Why would that be good? Maybe a patient has you know, predisposed to like MI, which is myocardial infarction. Maybe they have hypertension. Maybe they have arthrosclerosis. Maybe they have just an underlying heart condition and arrhythmia. Um, so a lot of patients that have underlying heart conditions will be on baby aspirin. For instance, my dad, he has atrial fibrillation. He was taking warfarin for a while, but it's kind of hard to monitor. You have to constantly monitor the, uh, the INR. Don't worry about that for now. But now he's actually taking baby aspirin, uh, 81 milligrams. And that's because it does this. It basically blocks the ability for platelets to uh, aggregate, causing clots, causing emboli. Um, yeah, atrial fibrillation, by the way. We're going to talk about this when we get into cardiovascular. That's when your uh, atrium starts fluttering, and it's all of a sudden, because of that fluttering, it's not pumping properly. So the blood kind of pools, and as the blood pools, it starts forming a thrombus. So it starts forming basically like a clot, and you can get an embolus. So you, a piece of that thrombus can actually get thrown off into different parts of your body. The biggest concern is stroke, right? So if you get like a cerebrovascular embolus, and MI, if it blocks one of your coronary arteries. We're going to talk about that in a second. So that's why taking uh, baby aspirin low dose, 81 milligrams, is good if a patient has something that might predispose them to getting like a stroke. <clears throat> so we kind of talked about a little bit of these. So thromboxane is going to be one of those uh, platelet activators. When the platelet changes, it's going to help produce more of that thromboxane. So that's going to be this little dude right over here. <clears throat> And it's a positive feedback loop. I'm going to answer that question for you guys. We already kind of talked about that. There's a couple other factors, too. Von Willebrand factor is going to be one. Um, and uh, glycoprotein is going to be another one. Glycoprotein, uh, glyco, think sugar. It's kind of sticky, so it allows for the platelets to kind of adhere together. So it allows for a greater degree of platelet adhesion. And then in terms of Von Willebrand factor, that's going to be associated with exposure of collagen. Collagen is part of your connective tissues. Right, so if you have collagen exposure, usually it means that you had some sort of damage to like the endothelial lining of your vessel. So we're going to talk about what that looks like in a second here. So let's talk about the coagulation phase, uh, which is the nightmare phase <laughs> of this whole section, because it's a lot of different things for you to remember. Um, so this does happen pretty quick. There are going to be a total of 12 clotting factors, 1 through 12. There's a 13th one too, but we don't really talk about that one too much. But there's going to be 12 major clotting factors. And there's going to be two major pathways. There's going to be the extrinsic pathway, which is this one over here. There's going to be the intrinsic pathway, which is going to be this one right here. And both of which can activate the common pathway. The common fact pathway is going to be uh, demarcated by factor 10. That's when, once factor 10 gets activated, that's going to be the common pathway. Extrinsic pathway, think E, think external. Think tissue damage. Think somebody stabbed you with a knife. That's going to be external uh, tissue damage. Versus intrinsic pathway, you're going to think collagen exposure. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about those two major pathways uh, in a second. 
I'm not going to play this video over here. Let's just, just talk through it. So this is just a summary from like a, a study here that was talking about the extrinsic versus intrinsic pathway. When we're talking intrinsic pathway, we're thinking that it's going to be involving everything that's within the actual like blood, right? Everything that's circulating within the blood. In other words, nothing is required from the outside. That's why it's intrinsic. Extrinsic, it's going to require uh, collagen. Uh, sorry, extrinsic is going to require actual tissue damage. And when you have extrinsic uh, tissue damage, then you're going to have uh, tissue factor or factor uh, three is going to be the one that actually gets activated in that. So these are the major clotting factors, and I highlighted the ones that you need to know for the sake of this class. Okay, the major ones that you need to know are factor three, which is also referred to as uh, tissue factor. Um, and you also need to know factors 8, 9, 10, and 12. Okay, we'll talk about all of that in a second here. Uh, but let's just really briefly here mention um, 8 and 9. 8 and 9 are going to be affiliate, affiliated with hemophilia. Hemophilia, which is a clotting disorder. I'm going to talk about those in a second. There's two, hemophilia A and hemophilia B. Those are going to be associated with both of those clotting factors. Uh, factor uh, three, that's going to be that extrinsic pathway. Once you have tissue damage that exposes uh, any uh, tissue factor, that's going to be associated with triggering that extrinsic pathway. And then 10 is going to be the common pathway. That's, both of those can activate 10, and then you have a further cascade of the clotting pathway. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things like cofactors that need to be involved. So calcium is going to be heavily implicated throughout the clotting cascade. Um, and vitamin K is also going to be associated with the, with the clotting cascade. Um, there are things that can block vitamin K. Certain drugs, for instance, like warfarin. Warfarin, also known as Coumadin, is going to block vitamin K. And so in other words, warfarin is an anticoagulant. So if a patient has atrial fibrillation, like my dad does. He used to be on warfarin. It's an anticoagulant drug, so it helps prevent development of stroke, emboli, things like that. And then there's that tissue factor three, which we kind of mentioned already, that's going to be associated with extrinsic pathway. It's going to be heavily involved with calcium. Um, <clears throat> so in other words, if you have an imbalance of calcium or vitamin K, both of those can affect the clotting cascade. So if you have a patient that has low calcium levels, you definitely want to make sure that you uh, address that in a clinical setting. So this is the, cl uh, the overall cas uh, cascade of uh, clotting. You have both extra, uh, sorry, you have intrinsic right here. This is all intrinsic pathway. And then this is all extrinsic pathway over here. So this is extrinsic, this is intrinsic. Now, for the intrinsic pathway, you need collagen exposure. So you have some sort of like damage to the endothelial line, for instance. That's going to trigger that intrinsic pathway. And then that pathway is going to involve all sorts of different factors. First, you activate factor 12. Then you uh, activate uh, factor 11. And then all the way down to you, to you activate factor 10. Once you activate factor 10, that's going to be that common pathway. And we're going to talk about that in a second. The extrinsic pathway, somebody stabbed you with a knife, right? <laughs> or maybe you poked yourself with a needle or whatever. Um, now you have tissue damage, and that's going to uh, stimulate tissue factor, a.k.a. factor 3. Then factor 3 eventually is going to stimulate factor 10 and activate it into um, activated factor 10, which will then by, uh, thereby uh, continue on through that common pathway, all right? And we're going to talk about that common pathway in a second. But, <clears throat> so the things I want to highlight here are tissue factor due to injury, extrinsic, right? Think external injury. And then intrinsic, think collagen exposure, okay? And you're going to think, you know, sub-endothelial type exposure. You had some sort of damage to the endothelial lining of your blood vessel. Um, extrinsic, factor three, tissue factor. Intrinsic, factor 12. That's going to be the very start, okay? Factor 12. Now, if you have any sort of deficiency in either factor 8 or factor 9, that's going to result in the two types of hemophilia, hemophilia A or hemophilia B. Hemophilia A is associated with factor 8. Hemophilia B is associated with factor 9, okay? 
And then common factor, factor 10. And what factor 10 does, it converts prothrombin into thrombin. Now think about thrombosis. Thrombosis just means blood clot, okay? So thrombin is going to stimulate blood clot formation by turning fibrinogen into fibrin. Now remember early on what I said, fibrin is like the ultimate final goal of this whole entire cascade. Once you get that fibrin mesh created, that's when you get the actual blood clot. So that's the ultimate goal at the very end. So that's, uh, that's when you finish up there, fibrin mesh. All right, let's move on. <laughs> all right, so here's just a good summary of all that without all the extra convoluted detail. So intrinsic collagen exposure, okay? That's going to stimulate uh, factor 12. Extrinsic, you get stabbed. <laughs> that's going to uh, create an external energy injury that stimulates tissue factor, factor number three. They're both going to eventually stimulate the common pathway, which is going to be uh, when you activate factor 10. Once factor 10 gets activated, it, act, it converts prothrombin into thrombin. Thrombin is then going to convert fibrinogen into fibrin. And then here's that factor 13 I was talking about. That's what's going to eventually allow for the development of that fibrin mesh at the very end. Um, here's a certain drug that can affect that pathway. Remember that we talked about Coumadin slash Warfarin. The other anticoagulant that's pretty commonly used is going to be heparin. Heparin is going to actually involve antithrombin. So in other words, it's going to prevent uh, thrombin from doing this, from converting fibrinogen into fibrin. That's what antithrombin does. <clears throat> so here are some other, uh, uh, another summary of those anticoagulants. So antithrombin, it can be produced extrins or intrinsically through your liver, or sorry, uh, endogenously. Um, you can also get a similar type of drug uh, ex, uh, ex, uh, geez. <laughs> uh, exogenously, heparin, and that's going to be do, doing the same exact type of thing. It's going to uh, basically prevent thrombin from converting uh, fibrin, fibrinogen into fibrin. And then warfarin, that's going to be a vitamin K antagonist. So it's going to prevent vitamin K from allowing uh, these different pathways to take place. And then TPA, we're going to talk about that in a second. That's what actually breaks down the ultimate clot. So when everything is done, you can use TPA to just bust the clot. They call TPA clot busters. Talk about that in a second here. So here's TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. Um, if a patient has some sort of uh, occlusion in a vessel, you give the patient TPA. It can block, or sorry, it can bust that clot. Now, if a patient has a stroke, um, you got to be very careful with this. Um, if it's a hemorrhagic stroke, that means that a blood vessel bursted and now they're bleeding in their brain, right? Um, if you, instead, if you had a stroke where you had like an occlusion, right, you could give a patient that had like an occlusion, you can give them TPA and that will help to break down that clot so that it can provide blood to those tissues in their brain. So if you, if you have a patient that has a hemorrhagic stroke, you never want to give them TPA because that will further worsen the stroke. Then they will just start bleeding out even more. <clears throat> now, let's see here. Synthetic uh, TPA. Oh, yeah, and then D-dimer test. Now, when plasmin, uh, when, sorry, um, <clears throat> when TPA gets activated, starts breaking down the clot, you start getting these fibrin split products. One of the fibrin split products can uh, be detected through a D-dimer test. So if you have a patient that has something like uh, DVT, or if they have a pulmonary embolism, or if they have a stroke, you can actually use a D-dimer test to be able to help uh, diagnose the underlying condition for those patients. Mm. All right, let's move on here. So this is just a summary of all those different pathways. So you have that intrinsic pathway, so it involves uh, factor 12. Then you have your extrinsic pathway, which involves factor three. And then these are how the drugs can help affect those different uh, cascades. So warfarin, also known as Coumadin, can block these different factors, so it prevents clot formation. Um, heparin can also block certain factors, uh, resulting in uh, uh, you know, uh, anticoagulation. TPA can also help in terms of anticoagulation by uh, basically busting that clot. 
So this is just a good summary for you guys to have as future reference as to what all these different drugs can do and their mechanism of action in terms of their targets. So let's talk about um, some disorders that you might see in a clinical setting. So if you had platelet-type bleeding, <clears throat> so if you have thrombocytopenia, in other words, you do not have enough uh, thrombocytes, aka you do not have enough platelets, you might get a couple different conditions taking place. You might get petechia. Okay, petechia, those are going to be those tiny little microvascular bleeds. They look like little tiny stipples, little red dots. Okay? Um, you might get epistaxis. Do you guys know what epistaxis means? What does it mean? Yeah, it's a nosebleed. It's a really fancy name for a nosebleed. Um, you might get purpura. Purpura is a little bit larger than petechia. So this is petechia up here on the top right, little tiny stipples. This is purpura. It's where the little microvascular bleeds become a little bit larger. And then you're going to get increased bleeding time. That's going to be one of the labs that you can do for those types of uh, conditions. If you have any sort of factor deficiency, in other words, hemophilia, A or B, you're going to get some more serious conditions like ecchymosis. Ecchymosis is basically when a large vessel is bleeding out. Also hematoma that's involving larger vessels um, and serious bruising. Those are all just very serious bruising. And hemarthrosis. Hemarthrosis means you're getting blood into your uh, joints. Okay? It's not supposed to happen unless you have hemophilia. Um, don't worry about the labs for this, but you do get abnormal prothrombin time as well as partial thromboplastin time. Um, bleeding time is actually normal for those types of factor deficiencies. But effectively what hap what's happening is that the clots uh, eventually form, but it takes a long time for them to form. So. so these are the different types of hemophilia, hemophilia A and hemophilia B. I know we're kind of running short on time here. I do want to do a couple quizzes, but um, let's go through some of these. Now, hemophilia A is going to be X-linked. Now, because guys have X and Y, they get only one X. If that X is affected, then the patient is going to have hemophilia. If they, for whatever reason, were unlucky enough to get, if a woman got two Xs that were uh, hemophiliac, then she would also be uh, developing hemophilia. But for guys, it's usually going to be, uh, it's going to be more predominant among males, just because they only have one X. Hemophilia A, clotting factor A. Hemophilia 9, clotting factor, uh, sorry, hemophilia B, clotting factor 9. How do you treat it? You treat it by basically supplementing those clotting factors. So if a patient has hemophilia A, you're going to give them exogenous clotting factor um, 8. If they have hemophilia B, you give them exogenous uh, clotting factor 9. So pretty straightforward stuff. So this is excessive bleeding, that's hemarthrosis, and this is like severe ecchymosis uh, on the child. So pretty scary stuff. So let's talk about other conditions. So uh, other terminology. So thrombus. We talked about like prothrombin, thrombin. Thrombus, that just means a blood clot, right? Um, blood clots can happen uh, if a person is inactive. Um, if a person takes a really long flight, for instance, and they remain in their seat for too long, blood might start pooling in their lower extremities. And if that blood pools and doesn't move, then that can uh, predispose the person to getting a uh, deep vein thrombosis. That's what DVT stands for. The biggest concern with the DVT is that you can get a thromboembolism. That's a really huge concern. One of the main places those thromboembolisms go to is right here, right in the lungs. So an embolism is basically a little piece of blood clot that travels from one site to another part of the body. And it can go to any place. It can go to your lungs, it can go to your brain, it can go into your heart. And so it can cause occlusions of those different tissues. Um, if it goes to your lungs, we refer to that as a pulmonary embolism. And those are extremely dangerous. They can kill you. Uh, I did have one patient that had that, um, but luckily we were able to give her uh, uh, TPA. She was able to survive. But a lot of patients sometimes get a, what they call a saddle embolus, where you have a giant thrombus that basically occludes all of the pulmonary uh, veins, sorry, pulmonary arteries. We're going to talk about the difference between arteries and veins later. Pulmonary arteries are, are the first ones to be affected by emboli. Um, and then if it goes into your brain, what happens? What's that called? A stroke, right. If it goes to your coronary artery, what's that called? A what? Heart attack, also known as? Huh? 
myocardial infarction. Excellent. MI. So, cool. Um, you guys want to do some questions before we finish up here? We got like four minutes left, so let's just do this real quick. We'll, we'll do like maybe two questions. I'll give you guys one minute to sign up. I'm, I'm going to take attendance off that first one. So, like I said, if you weren't able to log in, give your name to Sawudia and she'll, she'll get your attendance logged in. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start. went too easy on you. Good job. Fibrin is the ultimate goal, right? That's the major end point of the clotting cascade. Next, and this will be the last one. Most of you guys got that right. So factor 10, that's going to be the initiation of the common pathway. Both extrinsic and intrinsic can both activate that pathway. So good job, guys. Um, have an awesome weekend, and I'll see you all on Tuesday.